ninth verse. First Peter 2 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Would you join me in making that proclamation for ourselves this morning? But we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Would you stand with me as we declare his praises this morning? Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing it to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. 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 It thrills my soul to hear the songs of praise We mortals sing below And though it takes the parting of the wings Yet I must onward go I hope to hear throughout a number of days The song earth cannot know They sing in heaven a new song of Moses and the Lamb. I want to hope to hear the angels singing to bid me welcome to mansions bright and fair. I want to hope to hear the glad heart ringing with voices blending so rich and rare. I want to hope to Master bring me a precious life crown that I may own and I want to hear I want to hear that mighty chorus sweetly I want to hear to hear it swell. Praise Him, you angels in heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and skies. 
I appreciate, uh, appreciate the way Lincoln blends new and old. It's kind of fun. I don't think I've sung the new song since it was first written in 1952. So, that's a great old song. 26? Wow. That's a, that's a great old song. Hey, a couple of program notes as we get started this morning. Uh, we're beginning our summer Wednesday night series this Wednesday night called Dinner and Devo. And... Uh, Actually, I want to change the name this year because I'm going to be talking about the seven deadly sins, so I want to call it Sinner Dinner in Devo, okay? Some of you need to be here. Just saying, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll, have, we'll, we'll meet at 5.30, is that right? 5.30, is that when we meet? 5.45. Be here at 5.30, okay, we'll fellowship and help set things up. And then uh, 5.45, we'll have dinner, and then we'll, we'll be done around seven o'clock that night or sometime, whenever I'm done, we'll be done. So it's, it's, it's all really a fun, fun time. It's one of our highest Wednesday night attendances. The food is great, and we'll just have a good time eating and studying together. Second thing is, this morning is our kickoff for our summer children's ministry. This year's theme is Fort Dependence. And you should go by the gym downstairs and take a look at the work that Amy and the children's ministry has put together. It, it looks like a fort. And they've got a guy rappelling down from the roof this morning, and it's going to be all very, very cool. And after uh, worship this morning, parents and kids are invited to lunch and then some activities throughout the afternoon that involve getting wet. So join us for that. It'll be a fun afternoon. This is a really great uh, ministry time for our summer. A lot of churches do vacation Bible school for a week. We do something every Sunday all through June, July, and August. So come be a part of that. And down here, down front, I want you to remind you of this. We have a few slots left open. If you can give one Sunday or one Wednesday night, could you fill those out? I'm just going to pass this around and let people <laughs> fill this out. So... That would be a good thing. Come by and fill this out down here. Help us fill out the rest of those Sundays to work with children's ministry. One more thing before we get started on the sermon. A lot of you uh, are new and don't know him, but those of you who have been here for a long time will remember Perry Green. Perry 
was a minister here at Twickenham for a very long time, served this church very well for a long time. His daughter is Laura and uh, his two grandchildren, Jax and Rhett, and they are all right here. So can you just stand with us? Welcome Perry and Laura. Welcome back, Perry. A, a genuine good guy, no question about it. So we are going to just get right into our text this morning in Jonah chapter 3. So if you want to flip over there, Jonah chapter 3. I should have already found it myself because I always have a hard time finding Jonah. Jonah chapter 3. And I, I'm just going to read the passage, all that. I'm going to read that whole chapter, but it's okay. It's only 10 verses, so you'll be fine. All right? So here we go, Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. You remember the first time the word of the Lord came to Jonah was when God said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach to it. And Jonah went the other direction. He got on the boat. The boat entered a storm because God threw the storm onto the sea. The sailors threw Jonah overboard, the fish, all of that. Okay, that's, so that's all past. So the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you, God is nothing if not persistent. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord this time and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth, kind of a rough uh, material uh, like burlap, a thing they wore in order to demonstrate that they were truly repentant and sorry for their sins. It was worn during times of mourning as well. Verse 6, when, Jonah, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered him with sackcloth, sat down in the dust, and this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. It almost gives you the impression that the revival and the renewal and the repentance came from the bottom up. It's kind of the impression that you get. By the decree, but, but nonetheless, it, it gets to the king too. And here's what he says. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Now let's just be real honest here. That's the most unbelievable part of this story. A man being swallowed by a fish is not the hardest thing in the book of Jonah to swallow. In chapter 4, which we're going to look at next week, a plant's going to grow up overnight to shade Jonah. One plant overnight is going to spring up, produce leaves uh, abundant enough to provide shade for Jonah. That's not hard to believe because we've seen kudzu grow. We know how that works. No, the real head scratcher here is that repentance goes viral in a pagan city. Now, why would that happen? We'll get to that. Here's a deeper question. Why would God go to such great lengths to give the worst city in the world a second chance? I mean, God does go to a lot of trouble here. He calls an Israelite prophet to go 500 miles north to, to preach to this wicked city, the prophet runs, God chases him down, makes him go again. God's going to a lot of trouble here. Why would he do that? And there's no question that Nineveh was a thoroughly wicked city. In chapter 1, God told Jonah, its wickedness has come up before me. Literally, its wickedness is in my face. The book of Nahum is a prophecy against Nineveh. It's a couple of books Later uh, in the Bible, Nahum chapter 3, verse 1, the prophet says, Nineveh is the city of blood, uh, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. I did some reading this past week on Nineveh, and I wanted to, I wanted to find out what made it so wicked. And I got to tell you, 
a lot of what I read, I really can't share in church. It's just not appropriate. It's that graphic and that awful. Here's one thing I could share with you. There was an Assyrian general, none of it was the capital of Assyria. There was an Assyrian general who wrote in what they called the Assyrian War Bulletin. They actually had a document, uh, they produced a document called the War Bulletin, they were, and they were proud of it. He wrote about some of his conquests. You've heard the, the phrase, I came, I saw, I conquered. Well, listen to this. I destroyed, I demolished, I burned. I took their warriors prisoner and impaled them on stakes in front of their cities. I decorated their trees with their heads. Merry Christmas. He goes on to boast about just some horrible atrocities, slavery, child abuse, rape, murder. Nineveh was hands down the worst city in the world. So why did God go to such great lengths to give them a second chance? Besides the big theological claims made throughout the Bible about God's grace and mercy, there's a hint in the book of Jonah. God, every time God mentions Nineveh, and it, this happens three times in Jonah, he refers to it the same way. God calls it the great city of Nineveh. Now, the word great can mean a couple of things in Hebrew. It can mean, first of all, just big. Uh, verse 3, we read this a minute ago. Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. At the end of chapter 4, God tells Jonah there are 120,000 people in Nineveh. So when God called Nineveh great, he's at least referring to its size and its population. But the word great can also mean important. Go to the important city of Nineveh. Well, why would Nineveh be considered important? Well, for one thing, it was the cultural and intellectual leader of the world. Did you lock the house when you left this morning? Did you lock your car when you parked it out here? I hope you did. The Assyrians invented the lock and the key. Uh, they were the first to pave roads. They developed the first postal system. Plumbing, they had plumbing. They developed flush toilets. Thank you, Assyrians. Aqueducts. They made significant advances in math, science, arts, and language. These people were brilliant. There's a really odd ending to the book of Jonah, too. You remember this part? I think we've, we've talked about this, or at least mentioned it. You get to the end of the book of Jonah, and God says uh, to, he's arguing with Jonah. We're, we'll look at this next week. He's arguing with Jonah, and he's, he's trying to explain himself and say, look, I, I love these people. He says, there are 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many cattle. Some of your versions say many animals. What, what, what is up with that? Let me ask you this. Where do you keep your money? Keep a little folding money in your wallet or your purse. I like to keep a little folding money. But most of our money is stored as a digital file in a computer hard drive that you access with a chip on a card. That's not where they kept their money. They kept their money in a barn or a pasture. And it was too big and hairy to carry around in a purse or a wallet. When God points out the cattle, he's not expressing an ecological concern. He's talking about economics. That was their economy. And, and what he's saying in, at the end of chapter 4 is, Jonah, look, I, there are a lot of people in this wicked city, 120,000 of them. They don't know right from wrong. In addition to that, they've got a very powerful economy. Jonah, imagine what would happen if they turned all of that wealth to, toward blessing others instead of hoarding it for themselves. So yeah, Nineveh was a big, big deal. Nineveh was important economically, uh, intellectually, militarily. It, it, it was important. It was wicked and it was wonderful. Here's the thing. As you look through Scripture, God is always interested in cities. God's always been interested in cities. Two or three centuries after Jonah, there's another empire that will be ruling the world, the Babylonians. Uh, because of Israel's wickedness, um, God permits the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar to come and conquer Israel. He carries off the intellectual and cultural and political and academic leaders of Israel. He takes them to Babylon. And 
through Jeremiah, God sends those exiles a letter. In, in, in Jeremiah uh, chapter 29, here, here's what God says to the Israelites who are living in exile. Build houses. You're, you're, you're there in Babylon. While you're there, build houses, settle down. You're not coming home anytime soon. Plant gardens. Eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek, now listen to this, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. God was interested in the city of Babylon. When Paul went on his missionary journeys, in every region, he started in the largest city. That's where he would have the greatest impact. 250 years ago, 5% of the world's population lived in cities. Now, 50% of the world's population lives in cities. And there's a lot more people than there used to be. Five million people around the world move into a city every month. God cares about cities because God cares about people. Now look, I, I grew up in the country. I was raised in the country. There is a sense of the divine uh, being surrounded by mountains and lakes and trees, nature Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, reflects God's glory. But people reflect God's image. People are more than just a sense of the divine. We are the image of the divine. And there is more image of God per square foot in a city than anywhere else. Folks will say, well, you know, the Bible begins in the garden. And it does but it ends with a city. God cares about cities because God cares about people. That's why he gave Nineveh a second chance. So why, so why did they take it? You get the world's worst city, and in one day, after one sermon, they suddenly get serious about repentance. Why? Well, I can tell you what it wasn't. It wasn't the preaching. Jonah was maybe the worst preacher ever. You got the worst city and the worst preacher. I wasn't there. I didn't hear him deliver it, but I can almost guarantee you that the delivery of his sermon wasn't warm and winsome. He hated those people. Jonah was like this guy who slept in one Sunday morning. And his wife comes in and she says, honey, get up. We got to get ready to go to church. And he rolls over and he says, I'm not going to church. And she said, don't be silly. You have to go to church. And he goes, no, I don't have to go to church. I don't like those people. And those people don't like me. You give me one good reason why I need to go to church. And she, she goes, well, to start with, Lincoln, you're the worship leader, okay? <laughs> That's for calling me a diva two weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a diva. Right. <laughs> I can assure you that Jonah's sermon was not bad. I made a baby cry. That Jonah's sermon was not bathed in mercy, love, and grace. And yet the entire city suddenly experiences this revival. Why? Because this is so important. Okay, will you listen to this? Because the power is not in the messenger. It's in the message. We're going to read a passage here in just a minute. If you grew up in the Church of Christ, you know Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, right? This, this is our, one of ours. They devoted themselves, right? We'll, we'll read a part of this in a minute right before communion. You know what we've always said about these verses? Here's what we've said, and I've done this. I've said this many times. Here's what I've said this. We've said this. If we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, and if we create a robust and generous fellowship, and if we faithfully attend to the Lord's Supper, and if we pray, then we will enjoy the favor of all the people, and the church will grow like gangbusters. And so what's wrong with that? 
Every sentence in that surefire program for growth begins with us, if we. It ignores the last sentence in the paragraph. The last sentence in that paragraph says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number. See, traditionally, what we've taken that last sentence to mean is that you don't join a church. God adds you to the church. We said that so people wouldn't think we were Baptist. That, that's not what Luke had in mind at all when he wrote these words. What he was saying, I think, was something more like this. When these people received the gift of the Holy Spirit, he created in them a willingness to learn. The Holy Spirit created in them a desire to connect with one another. The Holy Spirit created in them a hunger for the Word of God, a hunger for God's grace. And the, whole, the Holy Spirit created in them a deep dependence manifested in disciplined prayer and a, win, and a winsomeness that drew outsiders to the good news about Jesus. The emphasis is not on what they did to grow. It's on what God was doing in them. Paul said the same thing to the Corinthian church. They were divided over which leader to follow, whether to follow Paul or Apollos or somebody else. Jealousy, competition, and arguing was tearing them apart. Paul wrote, what, what, is, what is Apollos? What is Paul? We're only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. He said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God is the one who's making it grow. So neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The power is not in the messengers. It's in the message. We confuse our responsibility with results. We, we, we think converting people and convicting people and convincing people is our mission. It's not. Our mission, our responsibility, is to faithfully live and tell the story of Jesus, to show what living like Jesus looks like, and to tell people what living like Jesus is all about. Paul told the Corinthians, God did not send me to baptize. That's a result. He sent me to preach the gospel. And, Paul added, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. The power is in the message, not the messengers. The gospel is not something we do. It's something Jesus has already done. We began this morning with a passage that talks about that. First thing that Lincoln led us in, that passage from 1 Peter 2, 9. You're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're God's special possession. Why? So that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Just a minute, we're going to take up our contribution. And so you kind of get ready for that. But we're going to spend some time praising the Lord for calling us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then we're going to move into a time of reflection on the sacrifice of Jesus. Remember last week I said one of the things that we can do if we, if we really want to become people that God can use is we can double down on communion. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to, to give it some time this morning to think about what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We're going to spend some time praising the Lord for calling us out of darkness into his marvelous light, and then we're going to spend some time reflecting on what Jesus did for us on the cross. And I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about what it means to be messengers of this life-changing message in this city. Right now, let's stand together and let's praise the Lord together. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all
Jody referred to a minute ago. Peter replied, 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And now we break bread symbolically together as we pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to commune together as Christians and with you. We thank you for such a great gift of salvation and the promise to restore both us and this earth. We thank you, Father, for the, the gift of this memorial breaking of the bread and taking with one another, with our brothers and sisters and with you, and for the reminder of what great sacrifice and gift that you made. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What can take a dying man and raise him up to life again? What can heal a wounded soul? What can make us white as snow? What can fill the emptiness? What can mend the brokenness? Brokenness. Mighty, awesome. The power 
Father in heaven, we come to you this morning recognizing that we have all sinned. None of us are without sin. Father, we know that that sin has caused a separation between you and us. And yet you sent a prophet, but not just any prophet. You sent your one and only son the divine Lamb of God, to become our sacrifice. Father, we're so grateful for your amazing grace. Father, we're grateful for your incomparable love. And Father, we celebrate it this morning with the drinking of this cup. We thank you, Father, for loving us and bringing us back into relationship with you. In Jesus' name.
You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in the darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. There still to be done in this city. Greater things are yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. There is no one like our God. There You remember the phrase that God used every time he talked about Nineveh, the great city of Nineveh. When I think if God were talking about Huntsville, I think he'd use that same phrase. Huntsville is great in many of the same ways that Nineveh was. It's great because of our size. Um, We are now, there, there are four major cities in Alabama, Mobile, Montgomery, Birmingham, and Huntsville, And we are now number two, and within four to six years, we are projected to be bigger than Birmingham. The city is growing. Lots of people are are moving in here. Um, So we're great in the sense of size. And just like Nineveh, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people in this town, as God described in in Jonah chapter four, people who don't know their left hand from their right hand. They, They don't know how to walk, how to live. Huntsville is great because of our influence. This is a cultural influencer in our state. It's an intellectual leader, a political leader in our state. It's great because of our economy. ZipRecruiter named Huntsville the fastest growing tech jobs city in America in 2017. Polaris, Toyota Mazda, two of the latest companies to to relocate to Madison County. Listen, if you are interested If you care about reaching unbelievers, you have to care about Huntsville. If you care about reaching the young, you have to care about this city. If you want to serve the poor, you have to care about this city. If you want to welcome the immigrant or influence the influencers, you you, got to care about this city. I'm I'm excited about something our kids are going to do this week. Every year they go off to work camp and usually they go to Nashville, which don't get me wrong, is a great city. A lot of y'all love Nashville. It's a little too much for me. It's kind of like LA without a tan. I'm not a big, not a big Nashville guy. I think it's good, great restaurants, get some great pizza there, other stuff, barbecue, the music is fine. I love Huntsville a whole lot better. Our kids usually go to Nashville, but this year, for work camp, they're going to go to Huntsville. They're going to stay at, at UAH, is that right, Ash? They're going to stay at UAH in the dorms, and they're going to work with some other churches in trying to bless some neighborhoods. I think that's awesome. They're, they are loving our city. They're loving this great city. We're, we're in some very early stages right now of laying some groundwork and kind of building the infrastructure for this church to enter into a season where we reflect on why we're here. We reflect on our vision for our church. And we we want it, we're trying to create, be sure that we structure this so that 
every single person in this church who wants to, and I hope all of you want to, gets to share what you feel like God wants us to do in this city. We're, we're building that infrastructure. I want you to, to keep praying about that. And, and between now and the time we roll out more information about it, I just want you to imagine. I want you to imagine what might happen in this great city through this church with the power of God. Remembering that the power is not in the messengers, it's in the message. Look, God sent a reluctant messenger to a messed up city centuries before the story of Jesus, and lives were changed. Imagine what would happen in Huntsville if God had a committed group of compassionate Jesus people to work with. How many unbelievers might, might the message of Jesus reach? How many scientists might that message reach? reach? How many church dropouts might the message of Jesus recover? Can you just imagine that with me? How many immigrants might be welcomed? How many influencers might be influenced by the message of Jesus? How many poor might be served? Now, I want to tell you, we can think about that, and some of you, man, that just scratches your itch. You get, oh, I, mean, I could get so excited about that. I just want to tell you, it is, it's an exciting thing to imagine, what God could do through us in this city. That's, it's an awesome thing to imagine, but it will not be easy, and it will often be hard. I think we kind of romanticize this idea of reaching lots of people for the lost. Have you been around lots of people? People can be difficult and messy and gritty. Uh, we were at the hospital Friday night with my wife's father-in-law for about eight hours in the emergency room, and uh, we finally got into a room for him, and we, he had a, a need, and a, we buzzed a nurse, and everybody that we worked with there, I'm going to put this, make, that, make sure I'm, you hear me say this, everybody we worked with was awesome, except for one person. But you know how you kind of define an experience by that one person? That one negative, right? Do you ever do that? Am I the only one? Okay, that's the way I do it. I tend to define, I define an experience. If something went bad, I, I, that's the one I remember. But everybody was awesome. They were welcoming. They were caring. They were compassionate. But we called for this one nurse, and when she came in, I really, I really wanted to punch her in the face. I just did. <laughs> I just wanted to punch her right in the face. And, but then I thought... There's a policeman down the hall, that'll be reported, it'll be in the papers that the pastor at Whitesburg First Baptist Church punched a... <laughs> so I didn't punch her, right? And then about three hours into our experience, they rolled this drunk guy just outside my father-in-law's door. Now my father-in-law is struggling with some dementia, he was in pain. Um, and there's a drunk guy just outside yelling and screaming. And I wanted to punch him in the face too. <laughs> you know what's in this city? Difficult people. People that are addicted to chemicals, alcohol. People that are not nice people. They're not nice. There are times when you're going to want to punch him in the face. God loves those people. God loves that nurse that was a jerk. He loves that drunk that upset my father-in-law. He loves everybody in this city. And those are the people that we got to love too. So we can romanticize it, think about how awesome it's going to be, but it'll be hard. It'll be a challenge. But the power is not in the messenger's it's in the message. Jesus died for those people. God loves that city. And we got to love that city too. I want you to imagine, I want you to dream, and I want you to pray about it. Will you do that? Next week, we're going to get back into Jonah uh, chapter 4, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be a really hard lesson next week. Just prepare you for that. It is not up to us to change this city. It's not up to us to save this city. That's God's job. This is his city. We're just the messengers. And the message we bring 
We sang about this already. The message we bring offers hope to those who don't have any. It offers mercy to people who are messed up. It welcomes home those who have wandered. It promises a future. It redeems the past. And it gives people a purpose for today. That's the power in that message. Are we singing again? uh, Would you dream and pray about this, please? Let's stand together. I want us to pray, and then we're going to sing. God, help us love this great city as much as you do. Help us believe the power is in the message and not in us as messengers. Father, when we are ready to punch somebody, help us to pray for them instead. God, help us to be exactly who you would be if you were walking the streets in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our jobs. God, help us to be you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Live in our hearts, fill this body, stir our spirit, help us serve, walk with our feet to the hurting, let us be you, revive our church, let us be you. Correction, I did not call him a diva. I called him a drama queen. And he's making my point once again for us right here this morning. Ah, before we close, a few things that are coming up. Don't forget children's ministry. You have a number of things. There's a lunch today. If you're visiting with us and you have children's ministry age kids, feel free to stay even if you didn't plan to. Join us. Get the games outside. Children's ministry also has... Service Tuesday this week and Love and Action on Saturday. So a lot of things in children's ministry uh, this week. New member lunch is coming up Sunday, June 24th. If you've been visiting with us or if you've already decided to place membership, don't forget that important Sunday day, June the 24th. Love to have anybody who wants to come. Directory pictures are coming back up. Yay for directory pictures. Um, Dinner at Evo starts. I think there's a volunteer thing that needs to be signed. Jody, you want to walk that around again? He left, drama queen, I tell you. And uh, we still need to get those signed up, so please sign up for us. I guess that's it. Hey, great morning. Thanks for being here. Hope you have a great day, and we're going to close in prayer. Our most kind Heavenly Father, great and awesome God, we are so thankful for your love, for your mercy, for your forgiveness, for everything you've created for us. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to give us. And pray, Lord, that you continue to love this city, that we continue to follow your 
your word and your light. Let it be a, a lamp to our feet, that our city might be a city on a hill that would shine your glory all those around. Father, we just hope and pray as this week goes on that we see the city and the people around us through our eyes. Uh, not our eyes, but through your eyes. And see the need, see uh, the opportunities to, to glorify you and bring you into the lives of others. We, we just praise your name. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. Father, we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And the Lord's Church said,